everyone got in then. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we are on uh, the second lecture of our Linton Lecture Series. Our Linton Lecture Series is a four-part uh, lecture series on uh, conversion, on transformation. Um, and so we are blessed tonight to welcome with us a uh, dear father to us, uh, Father Carlos Ibrahim. Um, uh, father Carlos is from uh, the Diocese of Los Angeles and its affiliated regions. Um, he serves at the Church of St. Paul, American Catholic Orthodox Church, um, and he's a blessing to all of us. Uh, recently, uh, Father Carlos, and Abuna, you could speak more to the book. Um, uh, Abuna published a book uh, regarding uh, sayings, 100 meditations by uh, uh, Pope Carlos, the same Pope Carlos VI, uh, which uh, we distributed actually here in the meeting during the March of Saints theme. Um, and uh, we are so blessed to have with us Abuna. Abuna will be speaking to us on conversion. Um, it's a full title, Conversion, uh, Transform, Transformed by Mercy. Transformed by Mercy. Conversion, Transformed by Mercy. We welcome you, Abuna, and we thank you for being with us and blessing us. Thank you, Abuna, and thank you, everyone, for <laughs> welcoming me into your, uh, into your hearts this evening. And uh, hopefully this uh, meditation will be something that we can um, reflect on together and uh, I, will there be time afterwards Abuna, for some questions and answers and okay Eric. yeah so at the end we'll open questions we'll have also a menti site for anonymous questions if anyone would like to ask um, okay so yeah at the end we'll open it up for questions okay so um absolve me Abuna, and and um, um, I, I didn't have a chance to hear the first uh, talk of your series so I hope I'm not uh, repeating any of the um, the content of that first talk, but what I thought I would reflect with you this evening on is um, maybe looking at this idea of conversion through our experience of the mercy of God. Um, and when we think of the word conversion, of course, uh, we tend to use that word um, in the context of you know somebody who converts from um, disbelief to belief, or from somebody who's uh, a non-orthodox to to the orthodox church, but for us uh, as Christians who are already within the, the community of believers, who are living within the church and uh, attempting to grow in the life of holiness and sanctification, how do we understand the the idea of conversion? Does it still apply to us? In what sense does it apply? So I think we can think of conversion as this, um, you know, process of transformation, as as Abuna Gregory referred to. Um, and very simply, we can, I think we can look at it as this constant um, turning away from something and turning towards something. You know, so conversion is this is a movement, is a is a constant movement in the Christian life in which we move away from something in order to move closer to something else. So we can think of it in terms of moving from sin towards righteousness or from error to um, a greater knowledge of the truth, a movement from self-love to selfless love, a movement from uh, lukewarmness in our spiritual life towards fervor. Um, you know, all of these um, sort of ways that St. That Paul, for example, speaks about the old versus the new man, right? Is it, and it's not just a one-time event, uh, although we could, we could speak of baptism as sort of the initiation into that life. But, but for all of us, you know, this movement from the old man to the new man is a constant, uh, a, a constant transformation that takes place in the Christian life um, to, to the very last breath of our lives. And so, in a sense, then we could say that conversion is is really the master theme of the Bible. It is it is sort of the enduring message of salvation history, and every prophecy, every uh, proverb, and every psalm and every parable um, is, in a sense, aimed at bringing about a greater conversion for the one who hears and accepts and. Um, and, and there, therefore changes because of the transforming word of God. There's a, a wonderful um, contemporary author uh, who did, a, 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 I think, a four-volume series on um, reflections on the gospel of St. Matthew. His name is Father Leva Merikakis. Um, and he says in there, uh, when, he's, when he's reflecting on 
um, the Lord who says, hear another parable. And he says um, in his commentary, he says, every time the Lord, every time Christ says to the people, hear another parable, he seems to be implying, yet again, I will draw from the treasury of wisdom my father has entrusted to me and hurl another dart of love at your hearts. Who knows, perhaps this time you will feel the pain of my absence and respond to my approach with a greening hope of your own. So this idea that every time the word of God is is received, whether we open our Bibles and read it or we hear it in the church, every every parable, every proverb, every prophecy that we're going to uh, reflect on during the Holy Week is in a sense this this dart that God hurls at us in order to, a dart of love he calls that he hurls at us in order uh, to awaken us to a greater response, to revive in us, um, again, the message of salvation. And, and so this is, I think, a nice way of thinking of conversion as, you know, the Lord who stands at the door and knocks, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if everyone here, anyone who hears my voice, you know, opens. So th- there's this constant knocking at the door of, of man's heart. There's this constant hurling of, of these darts of love that are in, in the form of the word of God, um, or even in, in many other ways that God manifests himself to us, even in nature, that are invitations for greater conversion, invitations for greater transformation. So, but what, you know, we could, we could ask the question, what um, sort of compels us? What opens the heart to this conversion what what in a sense um convinces man that he should change right and for sure i would say that we 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 don't want to answer that by saying that it is guilt or shame or just a sense of our sinfulness because i think all of us have 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 the experience of how crippling that shame and that guilt um can make one and it and it it doesn't always uh, really bring about a positive change. So what is it that, that truly sort of inspires us to begin the process of conversion or to go into a greater degree of conversion? And I would say for us in our meditation this evening that it's the mercy of God, that it's God's mercy that is really the, the core of um, that possibility of conversion. There's a beautiful quote from um, uh, the late Pope John Paul II. He says, conversion to God always consists in discovering his mercy. Those who come to know God in this way can live only in a state of being continually converted to him. This marks the most profound element in the pilgrimage of every man and woman on earth. So when I read this quote, it really sort of struck me, this idea that conversion always consists in discovering the mercy of God which means that we can never exhaust that discovery. We can never sort of, even if we've had a, 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 you know, a significant conversion experience at one point in our life, we could never say that, oh, I've discovered the fullness of God's mercy. God's mercy is, is an infinite ocean, and, and we can only begin to experience a greater degree of it in this life, which is never ending. Um, so... That might then lead us to the question of well, what do we mean by mercy? What, what, what is God's mercy? Um, and mercy is a form of love. Uh, but what, if we want to sort of distinguish, well, what is the difference between saying God loves us and God is merciful to, towards us or, or God manifests love to, towards us or God manifests mercy towards us? Is there a difference? Can we make a distinction? And I think it might be helpful to think of love in general um, seeks the good of the other. So when we say that God loves the righteous and the unrighteous, he sends his reign and, you know, upon the, the righteous and the wicked, it means that God wills the good of man. God is constantly seeking to do good towards man and to will the good of man. But mercy is, is a form of love, but mercy, we could say, is um, a love that reaches down to everything that plagues man, that, that 
everything um, that seeks to lift up man in his misery. Um, so whereas love in general is, is, is the willing of the good of the other, mercy is the, the awareness of the misery of the other and the desire and the will to, to raise that person from their, from, their, um, from their misery or from everything that plagues them. And so when we think about God's love, yes, God's love is that he wills the good for us, but his mercy is that he, in his love, he sees everything that plagues man. He sees that we are under the corruption um, of our, um, our, 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 our foreparents. He sees that we are, you know, mired in sin. He sees that we are, you know, um, inclined towards the passions and so on. So he, he sees what plagues humanity and he, in his love, he desires to alleviate. He desires to lift up humanity from everything that plagues humanity. And, and this we could, we could say is, is how we experience God's love as a form of mercy. Um, but I think it's important that mercy is not confused with, with sort of just an empathy, right? Mercy is not uh, simply that God uh, pities us, although he certainly does pity us. But the, the, the experience of pity or compassion towards uh, the, the other who is in misery um, is coupled with a readiness to not only, um, we can say, alleviate, but even share in that other person's burden, right? And this is the beauty of the incarnation and, and the death and resurrection of Christ is that he, in his compassion, he, he sees, of course, the condition of man. He not only wills to alleviate the condition of man and, and, and remedy the condition of man, but he wills to share in it, right? And that's sort of a profound, I think, uh, understanding of, of, of how God manifests love in the form of mercy, right? So, so if then, if we have that sort of understanding of mercy, and we go back to that beautiful quote of um, the late Pope John Paul II, we see how it's in that experience of how God um, reaches into humanity in his mercy that ultimately convinces us of, of his love and convinces us of the, um, the desire to turn to him with our whole being and to, um, to turn away from all that is uh, participating in, in what plagues us, right? The, the love of the world and the desires of the world and to turn ourselves totally to him um, and, and, and to live our life in that constant transformation towards him. Not because again, of guilt and shame, but because of that overwhelming love in the form of mercy that's calling us, that's inviting us, that's attracting us and inspiring us. Um, there's a beautiful um, uh, verse in Psalm 145, verse 9. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Um, so this, this, this concept of mercy is coupled with we might say graciousness, kindness, um, compassion, all of these uh, are, are ways of, of describing this mercy of God. And um, I think we can say that mercy is the greatest attribute of, of, of God. It's the greatest manifestation of his love. Um, and, and what makes mercy... Um, such a powerful uh, experience in, in, in our relationship with God is that there is, is uh, to the extent that one is mired in misery, the more the person has the right to mercy, right? And so this is sort of, again, the mystery of, of God's mercy is that the greater the sinner, the greater the sinner is entitled to the great mercy of God. Um, so God's graciousness, his mercy, his compassion, and his love grows in proportion to sin, right? It's not the other way around. Sometimes I think, you know, we struggle in our spiritual lives because we think that as sin repeats it, or maybe even increases in, in our lives, that somehow we are less, um, entitled to God's mercy, but it's exactly the opposite. The more sin is present, the more corruption and death are realities, 
the more we have the right to God's mercy. And that's why Christ says, for example, in the, in the parable, um, at the end of the parable, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just or righteous persons who need no repentance. In other words, there is greater joy where sin is than where there is righteousness in the, in, in the sense that because God's mercy is, again, proportionate to, um, to sin. So, again, our continual conversion consists in responding to this mercy of God um, because it fills our hearts with, with gratitude. It fills our hearts with joy. It fills our hearts with hope. Um, and, and, and those are the things that inspire us to propel ourselves forward. Those are not the things the, you know, guilt and shame and, and sort of despondency and despair being sort of the conclusion of guilt and shame. Um, th- they don't, of course, move us in the right direction. But, but when our hearts are filled with hope and gratitude and joy, then, then we have the possibility of overcoming ourselves and, and you know, and moving forward. Um, there's a beautiful quote that uh, a priest uh, wrote in his, I think it was in his blog, and he said, the point of being a Christian is that we have found the answer to the fear, shame, and pain within our hearts. We have found the answer. We know the answer. We have come to love the answer. And we are called to give that answer to the aching hearts in our own time and place, the mercy of God. Right? So the point of being a Christian is that we have found the answer to all that plagues us, to, to all of the fear, the shame, and the pain that's within our hearts. And the answer is the mercy of God. Um, another beautiful definition of mercy is um, given uh, by a, a priest. His name is Father Boniface. He says, when vulnerability is met with unconditional love, it is an experience of mercy. When vulnerability is met with unconditional love, it is an experience of mercy. So we can think of the vulnerability of, 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 of being a sinner, the vulnerability of Again, all that is part of my weakness. When that um, condition is met with unconditional love, that's the experience of, of mercy. Um, so in, in, of course, this life of conversion, this constant transformation um, of the human person, we, we often speak of repentance. Um, and, uh, and of course, that is uh, absolutely true, that repentance is at the core. But I think also it's important that we have a, a, a good definition or a good understanding of, of repentance, the cycle of repentance. Because often, again, times we can think of repentance as simply the contrition that accompanies sin um, or or even the contrition that accompanies sin with the desire to change. But even then, that's not the, the, the complete cycle of repentance, right? Um, and so St. Isaac the Syrian, he, he speaks of um, what he calls bitter tears and sweet tears um, in, in relationship to repentance. So what he speaks, when he speaks of bitter tears, he's speaking of the, 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 the tears over our sins, the, the, the contrition that we feel um, in the face of our sins. But when he speaks of um, sweet tears, he speaks of the tears that are accompanying the joy and the hope and the gratitude and the love of the consolation that we receive in the mercy of God. Right? And so when the saints weep, they, they weep both in the sense of having a sense of their weakness and their sinfulness, but also in the sense of being overwhelmed by the mercy and love of God, of which they understand they are receiving it as a pure gift. Right? Um, and so this is what distinguishes um, what we might call uh, uh, spiritual tears from psychological tears. Psychological tears, of course, are, are, are the tears that accompany the loss of an earthly good. You know, uh, I have a you know, broken leg or I, I, I lost uh, a friend. Um, in that sense, these are, are more psych, what we call psychological tears. And, and those, of course, psychological tears can just be one-sided. They can just 
you know, be filled with grief and sorrow. But the spiritual tears always should, should have both those two components, what St. Isaac calls the bitter tears and the sweet tears. Um, because the spiritual um, tears, again, are always, uh, they always go beyond uh, simply the, 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 the compunction or the pain of sin, uh, but also are the tears that are, are representative of the gratitude of God's consolation, of, of the joy that we receive in his, in his mercy. So um, there's a, I'll read one of the beautiful quotes that St. Isaac says about this. He says, when the recollection of God is stirred in his mind, straight away his heart is kindled by the love of him and his eyes pour forth abundant tears. For love is wont to ignite tears by the recollection of, beloved, of the beloved ones. A man who is in, a, in this state will never be found destitute of tears because that which brings him to the recollection of God is never absent from him. Wherefore, even in sleep, he converses with God, for love is wont to cause such things. Right? So here he's, he's talking about the tears that accompany the recollection of God, which is stirred in the mind, right, or kindled in the heart. And, um, and, and, and so these are the tears of, of God's mercy, the tears of God's love that he shows to us in the state of our, our sinfulness. Um, there's another beautiful quote I wanted to read from uh, Father Zacharias Zacharu. Um, he says, Repentance is the turning of our whole being towards God. Even as we feel a certain pain within ourselves, this pain is bitter in the beginning because we bear the wounds of sin. But once our wounds heal up, repentance becomes sweet. One of the saints says that honey is sweet to the tongue, but if the tongue is wounded, instead of tasting sweetness, it feels pain. The same is true of repentance. When we see our poverty, we lament over it until our lamentations are transformed into tears of love for this great God of ours. So, so that first those tears are the bitter tears, but then when he says, when our lamentations are transformed into tears of love for this great God of ours, meaning for the goodness of God in his mercy towards us and the consolation that he gives in our repentance. And I think... Um, Beautifully, this is exemplified in the prodigal son, right? And I, I know we probably um, exhausted this Lent meditations on the prodigal son, but um, I think it is just, you know, again, important to point out that since this parable is sort of the, you know, the, the, uh, the prototypical um, representation of, of repentance, that um, w we remember that the the younger son, when he came to himself and had the contrition or the regret for his sin and had the desire to return home, that he was not yet experiencing the mercy and the love of the father, right? And, 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 and as he returns back and he's replaying in his mind what he's going to say to his father, uh, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me as one of your hired servants. Right? We see there sort of the beginnings of regret and contrition and the desire to return home. But it's not until the father um, who is running, right? And, and I always love to think about how the, 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 the younger son is walking home, but the father is running. Right? And the father running to embrace the, his younger son who falls on his, on his son's neck, kissing him, covering his shame and refuses to... Um, to accept the words of, of, of being asked to be received as a servant and not as a son. And I think that this moment of experiencing the mercy of the father is what changes the younger son into, into again, returning him to that true stature of sonship. Um, and so we can't forget that last component is the most important. It's not just, you know, recognition of our sin it's not even feeling the pain of our sin it's not even simply the desire to stop sinning but but ultimately what is going to give us the strength and the consolation is the embrace of god's mercy is to receive his mercy to accept his mercy and to be grateful and hopeful in that mercy um so you know again the key is is in the word my father Right. I will return to my father's house. Right? And so um, we, we can never lose sight of 
uh, this expression, my father, I will arise and go to my father. Um, and so we could say that the key to repentance is always my father and my father's house. Um, um, so um, again, uh, I want to read a beautiful quote from um, a Carmelite nun. Her name is S Sister Ruth Burroughs. And, and those who have heard me give talks before know that I, I, like, I like quoting her quite often. Um, so along with the parable of the prodigal son, there's um, uh, the, the parable of the, the lost sheep and the lost coin. And so she, she um, sums up these three parables and says, all three characters, that is of the three parables, tell us of God, of God, of how God runs out to meet us, labors to find us, oblivious of the grief we have caused. We are shown how precious we are, what joy God has in us when we are at home, safe and trusting in love. The sheep, the coin, contribute nothing to their rescue, and the prodigal's movement is minimal. It is the father who brings him home. God is forgiveness. We have only to receive. No act of ours is needed to bring a change in the divine heart to induce it to turn to us in mercy. So we, we don't need to convince God, in a sense, to turn to us or to be merciful to us. He is mercy. He is love. He is forgiveness. Um, and it is him who, who comes in, in search of us, in, in, in search of not just uh, raising us up from our sinfulness, but more importantly, showering us with his mercy and his love. Uh, so mercy inspires confidence. Mercy inspires confidence. And this is what we need to change. Again, uh, there's a beautiful um, story or, or um, example that's given by another uh, famous uh, Western saint, St. Therese of Lisieux. Um, she speaks about a father who has two children. She says, mischievous and disobedient. And when he comes to punish them, he sees one of them who trembles and gets away from him in terror, ha having, however, in the bottom of his heart, the feeling that he deserves to be punished. And his brother, on the contrary, throws himself into his father's arms, saying that he is sorry for having caused him any trouble, that he loves him, and to prove it, he will be good from now on. And if this child asked his father to punish him with a kiss, I do not believe that the heart of the happy father could resist the filial confidence of his child whose sincerity and love he knows. He realizes, however, that more than once his son will fall into the same faults, but he is prepared to pardon him always if his son always takes him by the heart. Right? So th these two images or this, this image of these two ways of approaching God, right? Both, both represent us in our sinfulness and our, in our disobedience and our mischievous, uh, but the one trembles in terror and, and runs and hides from, from, from his father. The other does the exact opposite. In confidence, runs into his father's arms um, and has total confidence in his father's mercy and his father's love. And, and so what St. Therese is saying is that it is this latter example that God wants us to, um, to emulate in our lives, to have that confidence in his mercy to have that confidence in his forgiveness. And that is what will motivate us and, and, and um, again, sort of propel us towards a constant conversion of, of our minds and our hearts. Another um, example of this might be looking at the, uh, the example of St. Peter, the apostle in, the, um, in Luke chapter 5, the great catch of fish. Um, we know the story very well. After the miracle takes place, Peter is overwhelmed and he, he sort of prostrates before the Lord and says, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And, 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 and the Lord says something very interesting. He says, you know, do not be afraid, right? Well, what did Peter, what did Peter do to, to sort of manifest fear, right? He, he, he fell prostrate before the Lord and said, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. In other words, Peter's experience was this being the sense of being overwhelmed of his own wretchedness, of his own sinfulness. And Christ says to him, do not be afraid of your sinfulness. Do not be afraid of your wretchedness. Do not run away from who you are. 
but rather cling to me, abide in me, right? And so the same thing happens to all of us. When we realize our sin, when we truly experience our sin, and as a matter of fact, if we are allowed to see our sin as it really is, none of us could stand, right? Even the sense in which we weep over our sins in, in, the, in the minimal ways that we do it now, it's only because God in his mercy only allows us to see ourselves partially. But if we were to truly see our misery, none of us could stand. But what Christ says to us is, do not be afraid, right? Don't flee, but cling to me. Don't run away because of your shame and because of your guilt, but do the exact opposite. Attach yourself to me all the more. Um, and, and, and so this is, in a sense, what happens in repentance is that we experience the gaze of God. We, 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 we experience the God who's looking at us. And when he looks at us, we are exposed. But that being exposed is not to cause us, like in the story that St. Therese said, to run and hide. Uh, but on the contrary, it's to jump into his arms. It's to cling to him, right? And that's what St. Peter did. You know, um, he left his nets and he followed him, right? And that's, and that's the power of the words of Christ where he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of this realization, uh, of this recognition that has come to you of who you are. It is true. You are truly that miser miserable person that you have come to feel at this moment. But in spite of that, do not be afraid. The remedy is to cling to me, is to abide in me. Um, and we see this also, again, expressed very beautifully with St. Peter in the, in, the, in the discourse on the bread of life in John chapter 6, at the end when Jesus turns to the 12 um, after many have left him, and he says, do you also want to go away? And Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. When we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, right? In other words, he says, we have come to experience that regardless of, you know, everything that is wrong or, or, or that we don't understand or that we see uh, that doesn't make sense, our only response is to, to remain in abiding with you, to cling to you. Um, so again, Father Leva Marikakis, he says, it is this more than anything that opens us up to God's transforming power in our life. Another name for God's transforming power is the glory of God. Whenever God's glory is manifested, it is never to destroy or discard, but to purify, transform, and vivify. In other words, God's power is always working through his compassion. God's glory makes him the father of the destitute. We need then to become destitute orphans and widows who rely on the mercy, goodness, and power of God. Right? So this is, this is, again, the heart of conversion, right? It's being opened to the transforming power of, our, of, 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 uh, of God's mercy in our lives. The, the, the case about um, St. Peter and, and, and sort of this, uh, what I described as the gaze of God, um, also has the opposite um, danger, which is the devil's gaze, right? Because if God's gaze is always exposing us, but in order in that being exposed to reveal his mercy and, and therefore to cling to him, the devil's gaze is the, is the exact opposite. The devil's gaze also reveals to us our misery, but without that confidence you know, but full of despair and hopelessness. Um, so we have to distinguish in that moment of recognizing our sinfulness and our weakness, whether we will respond to God's gaze or the devil's gaze. God's gaze will, will invite us to cling to him. The devil's gaze will, will, will cause us to follow Judas, right? I mean, we could say that, um, that Judas followed the gaze of the devil rather than he followed the gaze of Christ who would have invited him back into his embrace. There's a, a beautiful story a, a priest uh, told um, in one of his homilies. Uh, it was about a, a home uh, that cared for uh, people that had 
severe uh, mental and physical disabilities. And um, this priest uh, w spoke about this experience that he had with a, with a young man there who happened to be also named Peter, who had Down syndrome. So he said, um, when somebody asked one of um, these men, Peter, if he liked to pray, he said that he did. So the person continued and asked him what he did when he prayed. He replied, I listen. Then the person asked, well, what does God say to you? And again, Peter, this young man with Down syndrome, simply looked up to the man and said, he just says, you are my beloved son. And the priest, of course, concludes that if, if we could all just listen, like Peter, to those words that God communicates to us in prayer and when we stand before him, when we accept to, to have him look upon us, right? Um, that's the gaze of God. That's the gaze of, of Christ. Um, what do we do in prayer? We listen. And what do we hear when we're listening? You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? That's, the, that's the mercy and the love that transforms us. That's the mercy and the love that gives us confidence in God to, to, to continue and to move forward. Um, so let me just maybe end with, with, this, um, with this thought, uh, and then we can see if, if anybody would like to um, contribute to the conversation. Um, it's, uh, uh, of course, in the Beatitudes, um, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Um, and so if we are transformed by mercy, then it is also for us to become merciful. Right? And, and this would be, I think, um, also how we understand in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He says that in the context of God's mercy. He says that in the context of, of God who manifests his mercy to his creation. And so it's not just a moral perfection that we're called to, but it's this perfection of mercy. And so we could say that the sign of conversion is a more merciful heart, you know? Um, and I'll end with this beautiful prayer that the uh, Polish nun, um, St. Faustina, uh, wrote in her diary. She said, O oh Lord, I want to be completely transformed into your mercy and to be your living reflection. May the greatest of all divine attributes, that of your unfathomable mercy, pass through my heart and soul to my neighbor. Help me, O oh Lord, that my eyes are merciful, so that I may never suspect or judge from appearances, but look for what is beautiful in my neighbor's soul and come to their rescue. Help me, O oh Lord, that my ears may be merciful, so that I may give heed to my neighbor's needs and not be indifferent to their pains and moanings. Help me, O Lord, that my tongue may be merciful, so that I should never speak negatively of my neighbor, but have a word of comfort and forgiveness for all. Help me, O Lord, that my hands may be merciful and filled with good deeds, so that I may do only good to my neighbors and take upon myself the more difficult and toilsome tasks. Help me, O Lord, that my feet may be merciful, so that I may hur hurry to assist my neighbor, overcoming my own fatigue and weariness. Help me, O Lord, that my heart may be merciful, so that I myself may feel all the sufferings of my neighbor. May your mercy, O Lord, rest upon me. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Right. Thank you, Bruno. Um, so anyone have questions? I'm going to turn it to Menti soon. Does anyone have questions in here? Let's see what we got on Menti. Bruno, you are so good, we have no questions. Oh, we got a question. <laughs> Okay, the first question is how can I forgive seventy times seven how can I forgive seventy times seven times as an act of mercy without feeling completely emptied out of mercy or forgiveness? Yeah. Well you can't. You can't you can't um, you can't disregard your feelings. Your feelings can um, undergo healing over time, but Ultimately, forgiveness is not a matter of our feelings. It's a matter of our will. It's, it's a decision we make. So somebody hurts me um, and my feelings are, 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 are hurt, my emotions are affected. 
I can't just switch off those feelings. I can't just force those feelings to, uh, to be non-existent. But I can, in my heart, make a decision that I want to forgive this person, that I want the Lord to forgive this person, that I want not to have this hatred in my heart or this anger or this resentment or this bitterness in my heart, that I want to be able to love this person in the way that God wants me to love them. I can have that desire even though I don't feel it, right? Just like I can take out the garbage for my wife even though I don't enjoy it always, right? Uh, I, 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 can, I can will something that I don't feel. Um, I, and I think this is the mistake that we often make is that we think that, well, if I don't, if I don't feel it then, it, then it's not real. But I think feelings and emotions are a very shallow part of our nature compared to the will, and the heart. So, um, yes, we have to will to do the commandments of the Lord, which includes forgiving somebody who has hurt, hurt us, even if our feelings are not cooperating. And we persist in simply willing it through prayer, um, through restraint. You know, so I would say <clears throat> at a minimum, we can uh, pray for the person and we can restrain ourselves from returning evil for evil. And if we can, we can, um, when a chance presents itself, we can do good towards the person. But even if that third one is not there, if we can simply pray for the person and, and to pray that our hearts are, are, are in, in um, alignment with the will of God for that person um, and to restrain ourselves from ever doing anything to, to harm the person, I think this is a very good beginning. And I'm sure with the grace of God, our feelings with time uh, also undergo some healing. Hey, everyone, I forgot to announce the Menti site. It's menti.smsm.nyc. Again, menti.smsm.nyc. So if you have questions, you can just ask them. We have a second one, uh, Buna. You mentioned that God's mercy does not require action from us. But throughout the Gospels, I notice that often... God asks a little action of us coming towards him to accept his mercy. What are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so um, there's nothing that we need to do to make God merciful, but what we need to do is accept his mercy, right? So um, everything is a gift from God, but, but we can't, we can't um, receive this gift unless our will... Um, participates right and so everything in the spirit, spiritual life is a synergy is a is a cooperation um you know saint paul says we are co-workers um with god so th god can um i think it's saint augustine who said god created you without your will but he cannot save you without your will right so there has to be um this consent there has to be this 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 openness um, again, behold, I stand at the door and knock, but we have to open the door. So, but we do not convince God to be merciful. We do not need to convince God to be forgiving. We need to receive his mercy. We need to receive his forgiveness. Um, and, and that's, that's the, that's the part that we do on, on our end. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps. Anybody have any questions? I have nothing else on that. Or if Abuna would like to add to that uh, question. Uh... Amen. <laughs> Any questions? I have one more. Uh, there's, there are monastic stories of conversion. Example, St. Mary of Egypt, St. Moses the Black, who had a complete and final conversion to Christ and never seemed to revert back. How do you think we can obtain this? Well, that's, a, I think, a very bold uh, statement to say that, that uh, as if to imply that uh, St. Moses and St. Mary of Egypt didn't continue to struggle. Uh, so maybe I misunderstood the question, but for sure, um, there are many of us who had a significant conversion experience in our lives. That is, again, from disbelief to belief, you know, from being an atheist to a believer, from being uh, very far from God and having no experience of God's love in our hearts to being overwhelmed with an experience of God's love and forgiveness. Um, so 
there are many examples of people who have uh, moments in their lives of significant conversion experiences, but there is, it's impossible for us to say that St. Mary of Egypt and St. Moses, the, the strong stopped struggling and stopped fighting against sin and stopped, you know, repenting. Um, there are, you know, reading the Desert Fathers, reading um, St. Moses, the, the strong, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the sayings, you know, there's still this constant struggle to grow in the virtues. There's still this constant struggle against the passions. So uh, one way of looking at it, it you know, um, if we say repentance is a change of mind or a change of direction, a change of orientation, Think of it as, as somebody who's, who's, you know, if you're driving along the, the freeway and you realize you're going in the wrong direction, right? So you exit and you, you get back on the freeway going in the right direction. If you just missed, if you just went one mile in the wrong direction, right? When you come to the realization that you're going in the wrong direction, it's not going to be a big deal, right? It's going to be a small, you're like, oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. You're going to get off. I only, I only went a mile. But if you went 300 miles and then realized you were going in the wrong direction, you're going to have a much more profound uh, uh, experience of, 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 you know, pain and regret, right? So maybe, you know, it's kind of a silly example, but that's how I think of, um, you know, moments of repentance in our life. Sometimes, sometimes we are so far from God that when we come to that experience of, of repentance, it's very profound. It's full of tears and, you know, it's, 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 you know, weeping and, um, you know, uh, this experience of St. Moses and St. Mary of Egypt and others or the prodigal son. But for after that, you know, there are many of those moments where, you know, we're constantly reorienting ourselves because we're going, we realize we're going in the wrong direction. Maybe we didn't go 300 miles in the wrong direction, but we just went five miles in the wrong direction, right? And so it doesn't have to be always accompanied with an overwhelmingly emotional experience of repentance. Um, again, if we think of repentance as a change of mind or a change of direction or change of orientation, it, it, could, be, it could be very subtle. It doesn't have to be a, a sort of overwhelming experience, um, but it has to be a constant experience, a constant you know, uh, redirecting of ourselves to the will of God and to following him and his commandments and his ways. So I would say definitely St. Moses and St. Mary of Egypt continued to struggle and to grow and to fight against the passions and to grow uh, in the virtues. And, uh, and I'm sure that they struggled a lot with their past and the temptations of, of, of their past. Um, so there's no, there's no saint who had like smooth sailing after uh, even uh, significant repentance like St. Moses or St. Mary of Egypt. We have another question, Abuna. Uh, is it possible that I love God and have felt his mercy in the past, but now I struggle to speak to God? I feel like I can't say I love him if I struggle to speak to him. Well, it's hard to answer this question um, in such a generic way. Obviously, this person, uh, I would, you know, suggest that they open their heart up to a spiritual father and, and dive a little deeper into what's going on. Um, but, you know, maybe I can answer it in the context of, um, you know, in our spiritual life, there are many times where we experience dryness or aridity and, and, and um uh, sort of this lack of fervor in our prayers and our worship and our readings. Um, but that's normal in any relationship, right? You have a, a, a very healthy marriage for 40, 50 years. It's not characterized by constant fervor and emotion at every moment, right? But what's, what is important in the relationship, again, is the will and the desire, right? So, and that's the difference, uh, how I define the difference between uh, dryness or aridity and lukewarmness, right? Where lukewarmness, at least as it's defined in the Bible as being sort of this dangerous spiritual condition, is a problem of the will. It's when the will itself is sort of tired of loving God and, and doesn't want to love God anymore. Um, but aridity, dryness, is simply the emotions and the feelings not cooperating in our love for God. So even if this person is going through a period of dryness or aridity uh, in their prayer life, in their service, um, 
But if behind that dryness, there's a, a desire and a, and a will to still follow God, that means the relationship is not lukewarm. It just means that it's, again, experiencing dryness, which is part of the spiritual life. And all of the great saints went through that um, and even greater degrees than, than God would allow most of us to go through it. Because it's in that dryness that we grow the most. It's, it's how we learn to love the most. You know, just as, and, and again, if I use the example of a, of a married couple, um, you know, the, the love is greatest when it becomes purely selfless. When I love the person out of my will and to seek their good, not because I'm propped up by sort of emotional experiences or feelings. Um, those are nice that when they're there, but, you know, if they're not there and I don't act in love, what does that say about my love, right? If, if, if I'm not in an emotionally or, you know, um, uh, in my feelings, feeling affection towards my spouse, and therefore I don't, do, I don't act in a good way towards them, what does that really say about how much I love them? But the opposite is, 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 is important, that, that we learn how to love even when our emotions and our feelings don't cooperate. Um, and, I, and again, I think we need to not be uh, in fear that we're displeasing to God or um, in a wrong relationship with him. Those times of fervor and experiencing uh, sort of uh, our emotions and our feelings cooperating come and go, you know, and, and uh, they're nice when they're there, but they're not an indication of a greater or lesser degree of God's presence, right? And that's really important. God is no more present to the soul when the soul is propped up by feelings and emotions than when those feelings and emotions are not there. That's not, those are not an indication of God's presence in the soul. And so I think we need to, um, again, have a, a healthy understanding of the role of feelings and emotions in, in our relationship with God and with others too. That is all the questions we have on Menti. Anybody else? Aguna, thank you. Thank you. Aguna. You want to say for announcements? <laughs> for what? I say for announcements? We're announcements? Announce. Aguna, yeah, yeah. That's if fine. A, Go ahead. If it's a can conclude us also and, and um, uh, include us in prayer, that would be great. Sure. Um, so this Saturday, September, uh, I mean, April 9th, we have liturgy at 8.30, um, Matins, a.m., um, we have Vespers and Midnight Praises at 5 p.m. On Sunday, we have Liturgy at 8.30. On Monday, we continue our uh, Lenten lecture, right? That's what we're doing Mondays. Um, and uh, our speaker will be Dr. Miriam Zakir. And uh, as always, we start at 7.45. I know everyone's going to be late. But, you, know. um, you can follow us on our social media. Uh, our handle is SMSMNYC. You can also join our mailing list, smsmnyc.com. Um, and that is it. Abuna, do you want to lead us in prayer? Sure. Absolve me, Abuna. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. I mean, our Lord, we thank you for all things, and we thank you for the blessing of our gathering this evening. We ask you, Lord, to remember all of our gatherings. Grant them to be to us without obstacle or hindrance, that we may hold them according to your holy and blessed will. Houses of prayer, houses of purity, houses of blessing. Grant them to us and to all your servants who shall come after us. Arise, O Lord God, let all your enemies be scattered, and let all those who hate your holy name flee from before your face, but let your people be in blessings, thousands upon thousands and ten thousands, times ten thousands, doing your holy and blessed will. By the grace, compassion, and love of mankind, of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom is due all glory, honor, dominion, and worship, together with you and the Holy Spirit. The giver of life was of one essence with you now and always unto the ages of all ages. And hear us when we pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one in Christ Jesus our Lord, one in the kingdom and the power of the glory. Thank you. Thank you, Buddha. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Pray for me. Have a blessed uh, holy week. Thank you. I want to answer the prayers. Okay. Mike, you got the stream. Right?